Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am super pumped to have my old friend, Paul Wells, back on. Paul, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Bart. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. This is very cool. Well, well first things first, the Neil Peart series you did was a uh, smash hit, especially on YouTube. That one was uh, Yay. Uh, kind of a flagship episode for the show and, and brought a lot of new listeners and viewers in, so I appreciate you taking all the time. Uh, to do that. I know you've had some good response from that as well, which is pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thank you to everybody who, uh, who checked that out and um, just gotten so many nice messages and support from people who uh, really enjoyed our uh, hours and hours and hours of total geekery on, yep. on Neil's drums. So yep. Thank Five you, plus everybody. hours. Woo. Yeah. Uh, seriously. Thank you to everyone for watching that. I've said it before, but someone told me they watched it three times the whole series, <laughs> which I think is the record. Maybe someone's beat that. But wow. um, <laughs> so, <Thank you>. uh, <laughs> yes, Neil is very special, but we're talking about someone who's very, very special in a different way today. We're talking about the gear of Tony Williams. Yeah. You are the professor of jazz drums at Juilliard, and you perform with Curtis Stigers and Vince Giordano. Uh, That's right. You know, you're, you're a jazz drummer. You're a jazz teacher. Happen to love Neil. But mm. today we're talking about Tony, which is a little closer to your, you know, main genre that you play, right? Yeah, I I, I have played a lot of rock. Um, and when I... When I grew up in in Pittsburgh, um, the music scene there is a smaller music scene, and you tend to have the opportunity to play a lot of different styles um, if you want to. And in New York, once I came here, people it's such a big scene, people tend to end up specializing um, quite a bit. So I, I did play a lot of rock professionally in sort of in the aughts, and and Neil was a, a huge influence on directly on the way that I play. I still remain a huge fan, obviously, but I don't really get to play like that at all anymore. Um, sure. I, I will actually point out, I know this is slightly off topic to what we're discussing today, but um, I had the amazing opportunity to actually play um, I, I've been in touch with the gentleman who owns Neil's uh, Candy Apple Red Tama kit. Um, awesome. He was kind enough to invite me over to, to check out the kit, and, and he actually let me play it. And, um, you know, he has it set up. He studied photos, and he has all the angles set up as close as possible to Neil's. He has everything tuned to the exact same pitches. And wow. you know, I'm I'm a professional drummer. I can I can sit down generally on a kit and sound you know, I can do my thing. I can sound like yeah. a professional. I could not play I sounded like an idiot trying to play that <laughs> kit. It is so hard. You know, it's just so different than what I do. It was it was everything about it. It was it was I mean, I can close my eyes and think about the setup and I know exactly what everything is and I can think about the parts, but to actually sit and play that stuff yeah. for me, it, it's just a completely different. I'd really have to spend some time in the shed trying to work that stuff up. I, I was really at a loss as to to what to play. Whereas, um, you know, with Tony, that's you know, he's he's. I mean, I don't really, I, I don't get to do that many gigs in New York. It, you know, getting to play that type, like the kind of jazz that Tony was associated with in some ways, sure. but it's it's a lot closer to to that than than getting to play like neil i never get to play like neil. yeah <laughs> so well, that's so cool that's this an is, awesome opportunity though yeah to play and, that and, kit. i mean wow. and talking about tony and and doing all of this um research i mean this is all research i've been doing for years i've been studying photos and setting recordings and reading interviews for most of my life with with tony and with many of my other favorites so yeah. Um, but but getting deep in to do this for this podcast was really, really fun because I, I'm such an enormous fan of Tony. He's such a huge influence. He's so important to me and to drumming in general. And it was really wonderful to get, you know, really to kind of go uh, deep into doing this research on him. And, and like you said, it's it is a bit more relevant for me personally because I do play in styles more like this. So sure, sure. Uh, well said. So a um, couple things first. I'm going to direct people. There is uh, an episode I did a couple years ago with Dave Goodman. That's a biography of Tony Williams. Dave, yeah. in, who was in Australia, awesome guy. He did a, his thesis um, uh, on Tony Williams, and it's it's very thorough. So we're yeah. going to leave that. We'll, we'll, I'll put it in the description. People can check that out. Uh, there's also one I did with Rob Hart that was a 1982 clinic breakdown um, that 
uh, Rob recorded because he took lessons with Tony and that's a cool one. So, yeah. so those are some examples of other episodes about Tony. We're talking purely about gear and to actually break it down further, we'll see. But I, I, I think Paul had the great idea of doing this episode, which this will no doubt be a multi-part episode. Uh, it's, it's, it's just your style, man. <laughs> uh, uh, no, this one is going to be, I think, primarily about the drums then we're probably going to do part two on the symbols and the hardware because they're both so legendary and his symbols kind of hold a special place in people's oh, yeah. hearts on their own. So we don't want to like we've learned through this whole process of these gear episodes to not rush and just be chasing the clock the whole time and 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 doing that. So um does that still sound good? Yeah, good yeah, because I think what you'll find when we go through this is the, the kits changed more than the symbols in Tony's case, especially in the 60s. He, he seemed to be using a different kit pretty much every year, um, uh, but kind of stuck with the same symbols more or less. Um, and same thing, you know, it, I mean, there's a point where it changes, but you'll see it's, it, it, it kind of makes more sense, I think, to do it this way. And, and yeah, we'll, in the second episode, we'll do, we'll do, um, symbols. I've done a lot of research into the sticks that Tony used. We'll talk about the heads because there's some interesting things there. Yep. Um, I even have some information about the cases he used. So, oh, cool. We'll, 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 yeah. we'll, we'll get pretty specific. And a very cool thing about this series that, uh, that is unique is, uh, in, the I don't want to say a number in one of the future parts towards the end of Tony's career when he was with DW, uh, we're going to have uh, actually a different guest on. It's going to be Scott Garrison, who uh, is kind of famously works at DW, but he was um, Tony's drum tech for a long time and worked with Tony personally. So Garrison is going to take over that DW era uh, because he has all the info. And I think it's I think it's pretty cool and and speaks to your character, Paul, to just kind of be like, Whatever gets the best info out there, let him do it. Absolutely. Uh, which, which that's going to be exciting. So that'll be part three yeah. or four or five, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> part 97. Um, part we'll 97. Feature, <laughs> we'll feature Garrison. <laughs> yes. um, so why don't we get started then? Um, Please. Okay. So take it away at the beginning. We, we can start with um, uh, his first kit, basically. Now, I believe he was maybe eight or nine. I think actually uh, Dave Goodman had it had a precise year when he got his first kit. But his first kit was a, uh, you know, for, for even for the time, if we figure he was born in late 45, so maybe this was like the mid 50s, you know, 53 or something when he got this kit. It was it was a Radio King kit. Um, you see it on the back cover of his record, The Old Bums Rush. Um, it's a great photo of him as a, as a little kid playing this kit. It's just a bass drum, uh, a rack tom, and a snare drum. And there's one little symbol and what looks like a very ancient pair of hi-hats with the very large cups, which are the kind of hi-hats you'd sometimes see in the late 20s, early 30s, like very early, sort of before... Uh, Joe Jones and Dave Tuff worked with Zildjian to, and Owen Chick Webb to kind of standardize hi hat style of being a symbol with a smaller symbol with a smaller bell. So you see sure. that now. All I can really tell about this kit it's 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 a big bass drum. It looks maybe like a twenty four, maybe a twenty six. Looks like maybe a nine by thirteen rack tom. And we've got a uh, six and a half or seven by 14 snare. Now, I am not a Radio King expert um, at all. Um, I'm hoping maybe some Radio King experts will look at this photo and say, ah, this is actually this. So uh, have at it, um, Radio King yeah. experts. Looks like a Duco. Yeah, Duco, Duco finish. finish. Right, right. Of some yep. sort. And looks like he's sitting on a regular sort of dining room table or something or dining room chair uh, instead of a drum throne. Um, yeah. So that's that's his first kit. Now, um, I'm going to read from a modern drummer uh, interview that he did in the um, let's see, this is the Jul no June 1984 issue of Modern Drummer. And um, Rick Mattingly uh, interviewed him and asked him about his association with Gretsch. You know, he asked him, you know, what, did you buy Gretsch because you had an idol who played Gretsch drums? And, mm. he, and Tony says, when I was a kid, I used to sit and look at the pictures of Max, meaning Max Roach, who was his first, you know, really big sort of drum idol. And he always used a Gretsch drum set. And I thought, I want to have one of those. 
um, he said, uh, after the Radio King kid, he said, um, um, finally, I had my first job, $30 a week. My mom helped me buy the first set um, that I bought for $20 a week, which I saved from the $30 I was making on this weekend gig. So I bought my first set of Gretsch, which was Silver Sparkle, the same color, the same sizes as Max Roach. Basically, the only photo I've ever found of Tony before 1963 is the one we just saw of him as a little a little kid playing the uh, Radio King kit. Um, yeah. The next photos you see of him are from basically when he moved to New York. He, he, he came to New York just before Christmas of 62, and his first recording was in February of 63. Um, his first gig was with uh, the alto sax player Jackie McLean, and he recorded with Jackie on a session that didn't come out until the 80s called Vertigo. Hmm. But we have a photo from the Vertigo recording session, and you can't really see the drums yet, but at this point, he's still like well into 63. Um, he's still playing this same Silver Sparkle kit that he got um, when he was... Um, now, I don't... I thought I had the year, but I actually don't. I think it was around 57 or 58 that he bought this first, the Silver Sparkle so he would have been about 12, I think. At yeah, that, point. that would that would. Yeah. I mean, he moved to New York when he was um, 16 um, or maybe he had just turned 17. What uh, December of 62, he would have just turned 17. Right. Yeah. I mean, he, he turned 17 December of of 62. So um, he's still playing this kit and it's likely I mean, Gretchen in the late 50s were kind of transitioning between three-ply drums and six-ply drums. Um, it's it's all a bit sort of hazy. They they did this. There wasn't like a point where they were like overnight, okay, we're throwing away all the three-ply shells. We've got this whole storeroom of six-ply shells. Everything is going to be six ply from now on. They sure. didn't they didn't do it that way. They they no. they kind of made this transition um where they they uh um, you know, sometimes you'd have a kit where the rack tom would be three ply and the other drums would be six ply or vice versa. Yeah, so like we a don't transitional really... period kind of, uh, yeah, yeah. For the company. It, and yeah. it seems that you see kits like that for a couple of years, they were really sort of getting rid of their old three ply shells for a while. Now, Tony's kit, the silver sparkle kit had die cast hoops. It, it, the hardware all looks to be kind of like late 50s style hardware. You don't see the um, what, what's called the, the um, kitchen faucet type T rods. You see the more modern streamlined T rods. That, that leads me to believe it's more like 58 you know, rather than 57, 57, you still sometimes see stick chopper hoops and things like that. Yeah. So, um, yep. you see this kit on every photo you see of Tony from February 63, um, well into July of 63. So he joins miles in May of 63, um, and does some recording and some gigs and the first real photos of him playing with Miles, they went to uh, to France in uh, July of 1963, and they played at the um, the Antibes uh, Jazz Festival, and they did multiple dates there. You can actually see photos of them. There's different photos where they're wearing different clothes. They did at least three nights there, or three three concerts there. And they were well photographed. So you can see um, a lot of different photos. There's, there's a great one I found from a magazine called Jazz Hot, which is a French magazine. I, I went to uh, the Rutgers University Jazz Library um, a month or so ago to, to do some research for this pod and, and, and found cool. some really great photos that I think very few people have seen. But this, this one from um, Jazz Hot from July of 63, great photo of Tony from the side playing this kit. And what's really kind of interesting about this kit, now remember Tony said that he got the same color, Silver Sparkle, as Max and also the same sizes as Max. Max was using from about 54, 55 um, until 60 or 61 was using a 12, 14, 20 kit. Interestingly, Max, although he had a snare drum named after him by Gretsch, which is a four by 14, Max always actually used every photo. I, I'm you hardly see photos of him ever playing the four by 14 Max Roach snare. Ironically, yeah. he used the, <laughs> uh, f the, the, the model number is the Gretsch 4147. Um, it's just their five and a half by 14 eight lug wooden snare. You can see that's what Tony's using. And as I said, 
Max's sizes in those days were 12, 14, 20. He didn't start using an 18. I'm pretty sure he got an 18 early in 1961. That's where I start to hear it on recordings. Hmm. Um, and I'm almost positive, both from sound on recordings and also from looking at these photos, that Tony's first kit here actually had a 20-inch bass drum. So the very, very famous, probably his most famous recording from this early period where he's using this kit is on his drum solo on the tune Seven Steps for Heaven from mm. the album, Miles' album of the same title. And um, I think a lot of people assume, I always assume that was an 18-inch bass drum, but I'm I'm almost positive that's actually a 20 on that recording. And on the uh, Miles in Europe recording from July 63 is actually recorded at the same festival, the Antibes Festival um, in France. That's the same kit. It's 20 inch bass drum. If you really listen to it, you can hear it's not as tight sounding. It's not as sort of like a, a focused a tone as you get from an 18. It's a little wilder. There's more overtones. It's a bit lower pitch than an 18. I mean, you can tune an 18 to this pitch, but it'll sure. be kind of punchier, shorter, uh, less overtones than yeah. what you hear from Tony. Tony's sound on these records to me is classic 20 inch bass drum. But after this, though, he did he did switch and then stick with an 18 the, for a long. Yeah, the yeah. next kit is an 18, um, the black okay. kit, which we which we'll get to um, yeah, probably yeah. in about uh, seven hours at the rate <laughs> <Yeah>. we're going. <laughs> but there's no bottom head on the tom. Is that I is was that just a... gonna I was just gonna point that out. Yeah, it's yeah. that this kit. Every photo we see of this kit, the photos that you see in the studio and the photos from. Um, the, uh, the jazz festival in July, he doesn't have a bottom head on this kit. And again, when you listen to the recordings that he made, everything he made up through July 63, so we're talking about um, Jackie McLean, Vertigo, Jackie McLean, um, uh, what's this, what's it, uh, oh, the second record you do with Jackie, I'm spacing on the name, um, Kenny Dora Munamas, um, Herbie Hancock, My Point of View, uh, miles, seven steps to heaven, uh, miles in Europe. If you really listen to the sound of the drums, you listen to the 12, it sounds kind of twangy and weird. It actually kind of sounds like a pretty classic single headed, but kind of yeah. high pitched jazz tune Tom. It almost is like, I don't know, it sounds almost slightly like Phil Collins higher toms mm. from 10 years later, you know, when he's playing Gretsch single headed toms. Actually, he didn't really use Gretsch single headed, he's using Premier. But single headed. But yeah, 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 that sort of like barking sound, twangy yes. sort of, it's just a different sound. You know, when, when you start to hear it and you think about, oh, that's a single head at 12, it makes perfect sense. This week's episode is proudly sponsored by GM Designs Custom Symbols. GM Designs is far from your average symbol company as they specialize in creating one-of-a-kind symbols that are truly unique. Their extensive product catalog features over 100 symbols, and they were recently featured in a very cool R. David R. YouTube video that had a glowing review of GM Design symbols. Their expertise goes beyond crafting original symbols. They also revive forgotten concepts, breathing new life into them for enthusiasts to rediscover. Within the last six months, GM Designs has achieved more remarkable milestones, including they currently produce the largest clap stack on the market at 16 inches, 18 inches, and 20 inches. They created Neptune, the thinnest crash ride symbol available on the market. The Nebula, a raw blank that's been expertly hand hammered, lathed, but left untrimmed, delivering the deepest, most soulful tone in a ride symbol. And they recently released the Odyssey Flat Ride, which is a very unique GM Designs take on the classic jazz flat ride. Whether you're a studio musician, a touring professional, or an enthusiastic beginner, GM Designs Custom Symbols has something for you. Explore their gallery of products, find store links, and discover their latest features at gmdsymbols.com. Don't miss out on the incredible craftsmanship and innovation at gmdsymbols.com. So another interesting tidbit is if you look really closely at the um, tone controls. So, so Gretsch were famous for having generally on their drums um, well into the 80s, they would have a top and bottom tone control, meaning a felt dampener, yep. a felt muffler that you, you turned a knob and a muffler would press up against the head to kind of shorten the sustain. And generally they, they, they had this, this sort of, it was a metal bar that would rise up and touch the head. And it had these two sort of rectangular felts. But occasionally when they'd run out of those felts, the felts were attached to this bar. Gretsch would use cymbal felts, round cymbal felts, and just stick them on in the same spot. 
Um, so you sometimes see Gretsch drums with these round um, cymbal felts for mufflers instead of the regular rectangular felts. Interesting. And Tony's kit on the bottom head, you can see round mufflers. Um, so wow. he had one of these kits where they had run low on on the square one. So he has a rare um, round muffler muffles muffling That's system. That's pretty pretty wild. It, does this kit? Is this, I mean, this is the question that we should probably just plan on answering with each kit. Is this kit still in existence and, and known it's, it's, you know, it's whereabouts? No idea. No okay. idea. I, I, I have heard that, um, Gretsch. So this is, this is important to point out because this explains why he had so many kits in the, in the fifties and sixties, it's been documented a few places that Gretsch um, if you had an endorsement with Gretsch, their deal was they they wouldn't pay you. They didn't pay endorsers like some other companies did. Like, you know, Buddy Rich was famous for getting yes. paid a fee to He endorse. started the whole thing. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, you covered that in one of your podcasts, didn't you? Wasn't yeah, there that's the history of drum endorsement podcast. Yes. That was the word on the street was that Buddy kind of uh, muddied the waters, I guess you could say, where he got well now he got paid and then again it's F, setting yeah. a precedence of like well okay now this well, person everyone paid. has to get <laughs> right. yeah, yeah exactly so, so, so gretch had a strict policy they did not pay any of their endorsers they would give you a free kit every year you could get free drums once a year that was sort of their deal wow. and it was great if you lived in new york because gretch's factory was in williamsburg new york in brooklyn um not far from where i live it's actually, you can see the building is still there. It's actually luxury condo lofts now, of course, but it still says the Gretsch building on top. It's a big building right by the uh, Williamsburg Bridge. And um, if you were a local New York drummer, presumably you could maybe go, I know drummers used to go and pick out K Zildjian symbols because um, uh, Gretsch distributed K Zildjian, not A, but K Zildjian's yes. made in Turkey. We'll talk about that when we get to the symbols in the uh, next episode. You know, you could, presumably, if you were a drummer in New York, you could go and maybe pick up your drums yourself. I don't know. but That's um, pretty awesome. That'd it, be really cool. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I would love to be able to go to Hamamatsu, Japan and pick out my Yamaha drums every year. But, um, yeah. you know, that's not the most convenient <laughs> factory for me to uh it's not like going no. up to williamsburg no. um so anyway th this this explains why it as you'll see in this chronology that tony kind of is getting a new kit every year up until about 1970 71 um he slowed out slows down a bit but um i i think that in some cases to get a new kit they wanted you to give them your old kit back which okay. I don't know what they would do. Maybe they would try to repurpose some of it. You know, maybe if some of the parts were still usable, they'd put it on some new drums. I don't know. I don't know why they did that. And I don't know if that's true or not. I just remember hearing that somewhere, maybe in some interview from somebody somewhere. I, I'm sorry I can't source anything more specific no, that's okay. than that. And I'm trying not to include, you know, theories and, you know, yep. things that I think are this or that. You know, I, I, I will try to very clearly state when I don't know for sure, sure. that something is, is the case. And that's the case with this. But it could explain why um, I don't think any of these kits are accounted for. The symbols are, but, but not the kits. And again, we'll get to that. Um, yep. Another right. interesting thing to notice about this kit, and this is something you see on, I think, pretty much all of his Gretsch kits that have rail mounts, um, is he used the extended rail mount, um, which means um, he had a little extra longer sort of point that the, um, like the little bar that the, uh, that the Tom actually fits on. Um, generally, there was a gear and then there was the clip right after the gear. So the Tom didn't really, it couldn't really go very high off of the bass drum. But um, Tony liked the tom a little higher, so they actually made it's in the catalogs. They made a little extension piece that that got the tom up about three or four inches higher um, hmm. off the bass drum. So he always had that. You'll see that in all of these kits. Makes sense because otherwise you have to have it like it's it's too low or it's far out or it's rubbing the bass drum. And yeah. I love hearing about the little unique gear and like uh, pieces of hardware at, at each you know. Yeah, time yeah, cool. Well, yeah. Um, so I don't think I have anything else specific about that kit, except to say that he used it. The last known use of it um, is, uh, well, basically at this July um, uh, festival in in, um, in France. And the next date, I actually, that they were in, in um, 
uh, at the, at the um, Antibes Festival, July 26th through 28th. And um, the next known gig that I have anyway, or recording session or anything, is September 20th at the Monterey Jazz Festival, which is mm. over, uh, I guess that's two, you know, nearly two months. And by this point, sure. we can, um, we actually see him using a new kit. The one thing I want to point out before I get to the discussion of this black drum set, the, uh, the, the black nitron kit that he used in 63, 64, um, late 63, starting September, at least, if not slightly earlier, um, is that um, there is, there's a rumor or there's suggestions or something. I had heard from various sources that the black kit that Tony used that you'll see in all these photos actually belonged to Miles Davis and didn't belong to Tony. Um, okay. Now, I think it's possible maybe Miles did have a kit and maybe it was Black Nitron. I think Miles had talked about like, you know, the band leader should have their own kit for their drummer to use. Um, Makes but sense. Every photo we see of Tony in this era, he's using the same kit and you also see him using this kit at recording sessions that had nothing to do with Miles. Sideman recording sessions he did for Blue Note Records. Um, he's using the same kit. He's also featured in Gretsch ads, photographed playing this kit. To me, this was his kit. Again, maybe Miles had a kit. Maybe Miles had the same kit. I, you know, I, I honestly don't know. I, I, yeah. um, you know, but but I'm pretty sure that this kit that you see in these photos is is Tony's kit. This is a Gretsch Black Nitron. Um, again, he started using it in September of '63, or at least summer of '63. So that would be when it dates from, more or less. Um, Eight by twelve inch rack tom, fourteen by fourteen inch floor tom. This is when he starts using a, a fourteen by eighteen bass drum, and I think Tony, yeah, I probably argue. I mean, Max used one. Max and, and, and Art Blakey started using 18-inch bass drums a little earlier. They were using them in 61-ish time period. Elvin got his first kit with a, uh, an 18-inch bass drum in early 1962. But I kind of feel like Tony, maybe even more than Elvin, I think really popularized the 18-inch bass drum. Oh, Roy Haynes also used one early on. Mm. Um, and all of those guys contributed to the popularity of an 18, but I don't know, there's something about Tony and there's something about the sound of the gear, the sound of the cymbals, the, the 18 inch bass drum. It's just so iconic to me. Um, I don't think a lot of people really, I mean, I've done this research, I've listened to recordings of Max and you can hear a significant change in the bass drum sound at a certain point where it sounds like, oh, he just got an 18. Same thing with yeah. Blakey, but I don't think people think about that as much as, like I'm talking about drummers, jazz sure. drummers or jazz drum fans. I think they think of, you know, oh, Tony, 18 inch bass drum, 18 inch bass yeah. drum, Tony. You know what I mean? That That's, yeah. again, this is my opinion, but- but popularity, if an eighteen has a lot to do with Tony Williams. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this I mean, these is are when, cool. These are cool looking drums too. It looks like we have different yeah. color, like a hoop. The hoop is a different color than the. Yeah. So when Gretsch uh, for Black Nitron drums, Black Nitron, I should point out, is a black wrap. It's just a covering. Um, they're not lacquered drums. Um, it's just a black wrap. Gretsch didn't really do. Um, you know, they did like Duco finishes and stuff like that early on, and they had. Like Cadillac Green was actually a painted wrap. It's a mm -hmm. whole thing. You should do a Gretsch episode at some point talking about <laughs> yeah, these yeah, finishes because yeah. there's actually cool history with that stuff. But Nitron is just a black wrap. But Gretsch, to kind of spice up black Nitron, they would actually do um, black hoops on the bass drum with silver sparkle inlay. Um, cool. Which is a great look. Uh, Ludwig did the same thing. Um, I think some of the other companies did as well. But that's why that 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 it gives the bass drum a little more pizzazz. I okay. should also make note of the snare drum because I mentioned that he used the standard five and a half wood snare drum with the silver sparkle kit like Max Roach used. But with this black kit, we see the start of Tony's association with the Gretsch 4160. The 4160 is a famous drum that Gretsch made um, starting in the early 60s. Uh, it's a chrome over brass. It's five by 14, not five and a half, but five by 14, hmm. chrome over brass. It's a pretty heavy brass shell. 
And um, it's a really cool sounding drum. I've I've been a fan of the forty one sixty for a long time. It was yeah. when I was a Gretsch player. That was my my favorite Gretsch snare to play by far. And Tony was a fan too because he kind of uses it. He he has some other snares, some some wood snares pop in and out, but for the most part, he's using a forty one sixty until you start seeing him play the big kit in the mid seventies. So he yeah. clearly was a fan of this drum as well. And there's some session photos that um, you can see from around uh, 63. You can also see the same kit, you know. While we're just talking about the snare, it's, it's, it's you know, he's, he's very much, in some photos it looks like more than others, but the angle of the snare, I mean, he's yeah. really leaning into it in certain photos of yeah. uh, what he's set up. It, it varies. Um, it, it changes, actually. He seemed to be somebody who experimented a bit with, with his setup. Yeah. Um, you see the angle kind of, sometimes it's, it's really very deep, um, particularly around, um, you'll see some photos from the um, autumn um, 1964 tour of Europe. Um, yes. Also playing this kit, the, the, the angle of the snare is very, very tilted. Yep. And there's a video from that tour. There's a great video from Milan um in i believe it's october of um yeah october 11th 1964 you can see the whole concert on uh, on youtube and he's got the snare pretty angled and he you know it's it's so that when you're playing traditional grip the angle of the stick kind of yeah. being like this and yeah. you know with the snare that angle you just get a, get a direct sort of contact with the snare um, like how guys used to march it would be on their hips exactly, a little bit right, at an angle right. and that's the tr yeah that's yeah. how it works and and yeah. tony also sometimes um during this era would actually and, and even later would actually have his hi-hat kind of below the snare um so that he would actually have to play you actually see pictures of buddy rich doing this in like the 30s where he would mm. play the hi-hat and actually have the left hand over his right hand to play the snare, which is interesting. Yeah, it's very, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very like awkward if you try to do brain. It. Yeah. Brain yeah. melting. Yeah. Um, another fun series of photos is to look at this Gretsch ad that came out around this, this time, this was done around 64, you know, maybe early 65. This is Tony's like first Gretsch ad. Um, yeah. Tony Williams and that great Gretsch sound. We actually have the sizes listed and they specifically mention the, the 18 by 14 bass drum. Um, in the type, you know, in the copy and, you know, they have the, uh, they actually call it jet black. It's technically, you know, in the catalog would be black nitron, but they call yeah. it jet black, um, 14, 18 by 14 bass drum, uh, 12 by eight, 14 by 14 toms, um, 14 by five Gretsch metal snare drum, um, so, yeah, I mean, that's basically the kit, as I described. You can see some nice detail there. One funny thing that Tony liked to do was um, a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time, he liked to actually mount the, the rack tom, what we would consider upside down. The the way that you see it mounted, on, you know, in like Gretsch catalogs and promo photos, generally the badge would be facing out on the rack tom. And he liked to put it the other way so that the mufflers faced out, the two round metal knobs yeah. that controlled the upper and lower mufflers. And I think maybe he just liked the way that looked. It and looks it does, cool. I'm it does that look now. really cool. Yeah. And yeah, Tony consistently yeah. did that with his Gretsch Toms um, a lot in, you know, throughout his career, actually. That's kind of one of his trademark looks. And I think it looks really cool. So, And, uh, and I think it, it goes without saying that, again, visually – uh, you know, if you're if you're listening to this, I think everyone has a picture of young Tony Williams and, and really anyone in Miles Davis's band of just being so sharp and well dressed. And I was recently watching the uh, Wayne Shorter kind of uh, mini series that was on Amazon, which is yeah. really, really good. I, I have to highly recommend it. But I think he talked about that in, in that about, you know, that they're they're like uniform they would wear, which is these mm. like amazing suits. The. With that mixed with the black drum set, it's just like very, very sharp. Totally. It looks great on stage. Absolutely, yeah. And and Miles was very, very fashion conscious, and he was yes. a, a, a fashion icon, a really big time fashion icon throughout his career. He was an exceptionally well dressed guy, and really cared yep. about that. And um, one thing I actually always notice, actually, is a little side note. Um, if you watch the uh, if you watch the video from Milan that I was talking about, they're all wearing tuxes. 
Um, but you can kind of tell, actually, sorry, I think Miles is wearing a suit and the rest of the band are wearing tuxes and they all look really sharp. But if you look really closely, you can see that Miles' suit fits him a little better than the rest of the band. Like <laughs> the rest of the band, like sometimes like, you know, the jacket kind of comes up a little bit, yeah. like they're just kind of off the rack tuxes, yep. whereas Miles' suit was almost certainly custom made for him, you know, so he's the leader. He's got more bread to spend on, on this kind of thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I, I should also point out that um, some of these photos, I, you may hear me reference some photos that we're not actually going to see. And that's because um, uh, I was able to, um, a long time ago, I, 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 I made an association um, in the 90s with um, a couple of gentlemen who ran uh, the um, Mosaic record label. Mosaic Records is a reissue label that was kind of associated with Blue Note. Um, it was uh, Charlie Lorre and Michael Cascuna. Michael Cascuna is still there. It still operates um, Mosaic Records. But Michael was also basically almost single-handedly responsible for all of the Blue Note reissues of um, things that were coming out in the 70s and 80s and 90s and all these different reissue series. Mm. Um, he's done incredible work going through the Blue Note vault and finding all these old sessions. Um, he also, for a very long time, was the the guy who... Um, sort of looked over he was sort of the the basically the owner mosaic records owned the complete photo archive of a gentleman named francis wolf and F francis wolf was one of the owners and producers of the blue note label um until the 70s when they they uh you know ended up sort of getting swallowed well actually it was in 66 i think they were sold to liberty records which became part of united artists and so on and so forth but basically he took the, the classic photos that you see at Blue Note recording sessions, these classic black and white photos of the musicians in recording sessions, um, yeah. were all taken by Francis Wolfe. And he took thousands and thousands of photos. Every session, not every session, but, but probably two-thirds or three-quarters of the sessions were documented on photographs by Francis Wolfe. And um, he, for every one photo that's been published – in a book or online or something, there are probably 10 or 15 other photos that were never published. And oh, because I knew um, Charlie Laurie and still know Michael Cascuna, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, visit their archive of photos a lot, like a number of times and hmm. take careful notes and things of the, the things that I saw that about the drummers. Basically I was interested in seeing these photos because I wanted to see more detail of the drum sure. sets that, that yeah. my favorite drummers were using, including Tony. And there's some good published photos. Now we, we do, thanks to Michael Cascuna, we do have permission to use those for this, um, for this video. Yeah. Um, so things like the out to lunch session, point of departure, evolution, these things, you know, there's some published photos, but there are also a lot of photos that I've been lucky enough to see that no one else has seen. So there are some things that I was able to learn about, Tony's gear, um, particularly things like the sticks he was using and some of the hardware and things like that, yeah. um, that, you know, no one else really has access to because people haven't seen these photos. Um, wow. and there are photos where you see things like the type of sticks he's using that, again, these photos for whatever reason haven't been published. Um, so yeah, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, I mean, that's something lucky, I may I may bring yeah. up from time to time. But you know, if I say something, unfortunately, we can't use in this in the series. We can't use photos that are not published. Um, yeah, yeah. But we are allowed to use the published photos. And um, you can, you're like you said, your knowledge of looking at those photos yeah. firsthand. We can trust you that you're getting the. Uh, <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's legit. So that's that's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the next kit. We start to see now, this is not a well-documented kit, um, but we see he actually got a second black nitron kit in the same sizes, 12, 14, 18. Although this kit, actually, you often see him playing a uh, matching wood snare. So you got another 41, 47 with this kit, the, the, mm. the five and a half by 14 wood snare. Now, I never knew that this was a different kit. I'd seen photos of him and like, I've seen these exact photos published before, but 
I didn't actually know it was a different kit, but what I re- the reason that I realized suddenly that it was is because of an interesting quirk about Gretsch drums in the mid 60s. They went through a period of time. Now Gretsch used two different size lugs for Tom Toms and bass drums. They had a small lug and they had a big lug. So 12 and 13 inch toms, which are the only rack toms they made in like say the you know we're talking about the mid 60s. These are the mm-hmm. only sizes they made had um, small lugs. They used the small sized lugs on those. Um, 14 inch floor toms also had f- small lugs, but 16s and then all the bass drum sizes use big lugs. And there's only a difference of, you know, I, I don't know what the measurements are. Maybe the small lugs are two inches long. Yeah, big sure. lugs are three inches long, but they're kind of distinctive. Now, occasionally, In the 50s, there are a couple of instances where I've seen kits where they must have been running low on small lugs because I've seen a couple of kits with 13s that had um, big lugs on them. In fact, Mel Lewis had a Cadillac green kit between 56 and 57, Gretsch kit, that had a 9x13 rack tom with large lugs on it. And it's very Hmm. distinctive because the lugs are pretty close to, to one another. You yeah. can really kind of tell it looks very different than a nine by thirteen with small lugs. Um, I also saw a picture once of um, Ed Blackwell actually playing a kit with a twelve that had long lugs. So they're hmm. out there, but that's very, very, very rare. However, between sixty five and sixty six, and this information comes from my friend Bill Maley, who used to be one of the major vintage drum dealers. He ran a store called a uh, ClassicVintageDrums dot com. Really great guy. Got a ton of info from him. Um, He was one of the first people to notice this trend that drums that are dated from about 65, 66, a lot of the time you find 14-inch floor toms with big lugs. I'd say maybe half of the 14-inch floor toms made in that era have big lugs instead of small Mm. lugs. Just 14s. Um, The 12s and the 13s you never see with big lugs in this era, but the 14s you very often do. And Tony's kit that we looked at before from 63, 64, every photo of that kit from that, from those verifiable dates, every photo you see of the kit from 63, 64, these are like verifiable dates always has small lugs on the floor tom. And then you see these other photos, some of which I actually have specific dates on where you see the big lugs. So you can see, for example, a really great photo. I have it dated as, uh, or I have it listed as 1965 to 66 US 2. The black and white photo, kind of a a dark sort of low light photo. It's a little hard to see, but Tony's playing his regular kit here and his regular symbols. But you can see one distinctive thing about the, the Gretsch floor toms, the 14s with long lugs, is not only do they have long lugs, but they mounted them low and used long tension rods. Yeah, I was going to say the tension rods see, are very clearly yes. long. So take a look also at the photo 1965 St. Louis. That's the yep. same kit with those long lugs on the yep. floor tom and long tension rods. Um, there's this great photo of Tony and Elvin together, 1966, November, Japan. Yep. Same kit, same. See the wooden snare? You yep. see the matching wooden snare? And then you also see the long lugs and long tension rods on the floor tom. Yes. And and all of this is to say, obviously just to kind of put this in perspective, this is to prove that it is a different it's set a different than kit. the previous one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. yeah. And there isn't really any other way. I mean, that floor tom is the distinctive way. There there really isn't any other way to definitively say this is a different kit, but this is Got what it. makes me quite positive that it's a different kit. Yeah, I yeah, also yeah. I want to address this photo specifically, 1966, November, Japan, the photo of Tony and Elvin together, and Tony's playing and Elvin is toweling him off, which is a <laughs> cool photo. Yeah. Now, yeah. I remember I, I only recently, this photo was posted on Facebook a couple of years ago. Um, it only kind of recently surfaced and immediately it was posted on like a Tony Williams fan page that I'm a member of. And immediately all of these people commented, Oh, that's a fake photo. That's such bad Photoshop. Oh, that's so, you know, like the, the, everybody just kind of dumped all over this photo. 
saying that it was a fake photo it was like some sort of Photoshop, some somebody's idea of having Tony, uh, having Elvin towel Tony's face, you know, while he's drumming. <laughs> now, okay, so to address this, we we look at Tony's. Um, so, if you look at Tony's chronology and you do some research, um, both Tony and Elvin, um, there's discussion of this event. In 1966, in November, they went to Japan with Art Blakey. So Tony Williams, Elvin Jones, and Art Blakey did a tour of Japan as like kind of like the Gretsch drum nights. It was basically, I don't think it was sponsored by Gretsch, but it was basically like this sort of drum extravaganza. Um, and I actually found a program um on, I actually just Googled it. I think I Googled like 1966, you know, Tony Williams, Art Blakey, and and this thing came up. It's on a Japanese auction site. Um, I don't know if it was ever on eBay, but it's basically a program from this event. And I'm mm. just kind of pointing this out to tell you what this event was. It's a program that says the Sensational Drum Battle, and it's got information. It's all in Japanese, so I can't read what it says other than the title it says the sure. Sensational Drum Battle. It has those three guys listed. And presumably it has information about the dates of this, you know, the dates of the tour and things like that. But this is an event that happened. Um, Elvin talked about it in an interview. Um, I don't know if Tony ever talked about it, but they did go to Japan and tour together doing a drum battle kind of a thing. And I think what this photo is, is a photo of this drum battle of, of one of these events and Tony was soloing and Elvin went over and, you know, Tony was so killing that Elvin went over and, you know, did the, the towel thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And you also notice that Tony um, has a mustache. Elvin doesn't have a mustache. Elvin often had a mustache in these days. And I also sent you a couple of photos. These are not drum related, but a couple of photos of the three of them outside of the Hotel Nagoya. This is absolutely from that tour. There's no other time that the three of them were in Japan together when they were all, you know, when Tony is obviously, you know, very young. He's 20 yeah, or yeah. 20. I guess he's 20 at this time. No, 21. Sorry. 1966. Holding an apple. Holding an apple. Elvin's got his guitar. Um, so notice that Tony has a mustache and notice that Elvin does not have a mustache. Now, there may have been other times where Tony, when Elvin didn't have a mustache, but it was a bit unusual in the 60s. He usually sported a mustache. For whatever yeah. reason, on this tour, he was clean shaven, and that's consistent with the photo of him toweling Tony off. He doesn't have his mustache. So yeah. that, to me, is a little further proof that this is actually from that tour. But the most important yeah. thing in relation to this gear is that that is the second black nitron kit with the big floor tom lugs you can see it clearly there yeah whether or not well, and, and i just i have about 10 or 12 mustache related questions to ask oh yeah uh, for you. that's very <laughs> no, well, you know we should do an entire podcast on tony's mustache i think part three the mustache no mm -hmm. but but i do want to say that i googled it kind of looking for what while we're talking looking for that program and yeah. it, 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 it took me to reddit and right away there's ah. comments that say this looks photoshopped they're not even looking at each other so it's interesting that like but they're like they're in japan they're looking at like things in a different it, to me oh you mean the photo, does, the photo the photo of them outside the of the hell someone said that okay. looks photoshopped so the photo of them at the hotel when it was posted on um that that photo also was posted on the same facebook page and the guy who took the photo a japanese gentleman i forget his name but a japanese gentleman commented and said oh this is a photo i took of the three of them on that tour when i was young okay there so you the go the actual photographer took you know cl it claims to have taken that photo has has you know commented on it um yeah they're you know who knows what's going on they're they're sitting around yeah they're not looking at each other maybe who knows what's going on they're leaving the hotel to go to the gig they could be yeah, any yeah, yeah number yeah. of things it's just a but very interesting conspiracy and it's it's odd that elvin has a bag that says ohio as yeah. someone in ohio i'm like what's going on with that who knows maybe the maybe continues. the entire state of ohio is in that bag <laughs> yeah. if anybody is, that makes sense if anybody was powerful enough to hold the entire state of ohio it was <laughs> elvin jones 
So as far as unpublished photos, there, there are some photos that were taken by Francis Wolf of Tony in September of 65 at the Village Vanguard. And they're great photos. The ones that are published, I sent you, and um, you can see the symbol. You can kind of make out on the photo number two that he's got the wooden snare. But I have seen other photos, outtakes from this same session, the same. It was actually a gig Tony was playing as a leader at the Village Vanguard. Um, mm. what I wouldn't do to be in attendance at that gig, man. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, <laughs> September 1965, Tony trio gig at the Vanguard. Yes, please. I will, yeah. I will be there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in, in the, uh, in the outtakes that I've seen, um, I can verify that the floor Tom has the big lugs, big tension rods. Um, I can also verify that the snare drum is the, the wooden, uh, 4147, five and a half by 14 wooden there and not the uh 4160 so cool yes so that's black nitron two two yeah okay yeah now i think we should talk about there's a lot to discuss about backline kits um but i think we should save that for the next one because okay you know let's try to get through his various kits that we know were his and not look at yep. the backline kits but there were a lot of backline kits used in 1967 because they did a tour of europe where tony was not able to bring his own drums so almost every night he's using different kits and there are a lot of photographs but we're going to skip that stuff and we're sure, going to go on sure. to the next kit that we know tony owned which is another silver sparkle kit and this was used from you know around 67 until at least early 68 it's another 12, 14, 18 setup, another kit with a 4160 snare drum, the, the curl over brass snare. Um, there are a really nice series of photos that a gentleman took in Seattle from a gig, um, actually a couple of gigs, because you see them wearing different clothes, um, a couple of gigs in uh, 67 in Seattle. And if you Google like Miles Davis, Seattle, um, you'll probably be able to find this whole series of photos, but there's great photos of this kit. Um, mm. Now, what's interesting about this gig in Seattle is that um, you can actually see Tony has got a second floor tom on his left. What actually looks to me a bit like a Slingerland floor tom, but I'm not sure. Maybe mm. it's a Gretsch. Maybe I am actually seeing a Gretsch diamond plate um, floor tom bracket the closer I look, but this is a different color. It's like not a matching drum. It's almost as though there was maybe some drums at the venue and he was like, oh, I want to try using a floor tom on my left yeah. or something. It's f um, fun. I mean, yeah, but the, the on the left thing too, that's very unique. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's definitely an experiment kind of thing. Yeah, and and it, it, it reminds me of an interview that you can watch with, um, there's, a, there's a great interview with Mike Clark, the fantastic drummer Mike Clark, um, who's a very influential drummer himself who played with Herbie Hancock in the 70s and lots of other people. Um, he did an interview that you can see on YouTube where he talks about um, going to see Tony for the first time. He said he saw Tony in 1968 at the Both And Club in San Francisco. And he remembers that Tony had two ride cymbals. He actually had a second ride cymbal set up on his left, kind of under the hi-hat. And he was doing huh. all of this sort of like stuff. This is yeah. kind of how, how Mike describes it, I think. It, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So Tony was experimenting. I think at this point he's like, I mean, if you think about it, it's like, you know, Tony could kind of do anything at this point. He's already yeah. like, you know, in his early 20s, he's already just like completely changed jazz drumming, massively influential. And, you know, he can do anything on the drums. He's, I think he was like, I don't want to say he was getting bored with what he could do, but he just wanted to like try new things and wanted to experiment and, you know, yeah. break down more barriers. And he started experimenting Which is cool. with it. Very cool. So you see this floor Tom on his left. Um, you see the things like Mike Clark mentioned the, um, the, uh, the, the ride symbol on the left. There's another photo from 68. I'll show you in a minute where he's got a big Chinese symbol on his left, but, um, Neat. Yeah, so you get some a bit of experimenting here. Um, uh, uh, one of the photos that we should look at is one that says 67 Zildjian photo. Um, now, this is kind of a well-known photo because it, it actually hangs in the Zildjian factory. The, the Zildjian factory, um, all, all of the walls at the Zildjian factory throughout the, um, 
throughout the complex there, sort of adorned with all of these amazing photos, both of the family, um, all the different generations of the Zildjians, and a lot of sort of letters that famous drummers sent them, and all kinds of cool memorabilia like that. And then there are also walls and walls of photos of famous Zildjian artists. Um, they're they're so um, the Zildjians are so proud of the legendary drummers that they have played Zildjian yeah. over the years, and they've got all of these great photos of them. And this photo is up of Tony, a young Tony, and it says it's it's actually marked as you can see that this label that's on it is actually the paper label that's on the literal photo hanging on the wall it says tony williams 1964 i'm actually pretty sure that this photo is a little bit later because i'm pretty sure he's playing on the silver sparkle 12 14 18 kit yep. that 67 he's, yeah i think this is a 67 photo yep. um but the sparkle is popping in that. It photo. is right. Well, yeah. I think Gretsch actually. Their sparkles in the '60s weren't they? Um, actually, a broken glass, not not yeah, technically a sparkle, right? A, sure, technically maybe a broken I, glass glitter. I'm not sure, but that definitely captures the light more because you see exactly. some sparkles that are cheaper. And I have a Japanese one that's behind me, a gold sparkle that's like it's not. It's flat. Mm. You can tell the flatness of some sparkles versus the broken glass, and that is catching the light and looks. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, so another, this is a, a really minor thing as we were talking about these guys being really well dressed. But I think another thing that points to this photo being a little bit later than 64 is Tony's suit has, uh, it's got a very high up lapels and the lapels are peaked lapels, which is a little bit more of a mid 60s fashion thing than like a 64. Could be wrong about that. He was a forward thinking guy. Maybe he was very hip in his fashion choice. Um, sure. There's one last photo of this kit from, um, it, it's it's from a series of photos dated March of 1968, and they're taken at Shelly Mann's club. Shelly Mann owned, a, the great drummer Shelly Mann owned a jazz club in LA for a number of years called the Mann Hall. And um, all of the great jazz artists played there in the 60s. And there's this photo of Miles playing there in March of 1968. It's a photo of Miles, but he's sort of framed by Tony's cymbals and drums. So it's actually a great Tony photo, even though he doesn't appear in the photo. Same kit, that silver sparkle kit. Um, but we also see a floor tom on the left. And it kind of looks like it could be a darker finish. I'm not really sure. But maybe he yeah. actually was touring with that second floor tom over there at this point. I'm not really sure. But kind of interesting. But there's definitely another tom there, right? I mean, you see that yeah. to the... I mean, it's know. kind of far out. Like, it's kind of far away from him in a way. But that's sort of a weird... You got to have it far enough to get past your hi-hat and stuff. Or right. maybe I'm seeing something with a perspective there, but... It could um, be perspective. It it could, yeah, yeah. It could be that it's a bit of a wide angle lens, which would bring the the floor tom closer, make it look yep. closer. I'm I'm not really yep. sure, but I'm not Tony Williams, but I've ex I've had that where I put a floor tom over here, and I just for me it was like I just never used it. You know, it's cool to experiment because you see people doing it. Again, he's Tony Williams, but. Do you like, have you experimented with that? I'm, I'm sure you have in your life at some point. No? I, I mean, I, you know, going, I, I think when I first got into Dave Weckl in the 80s, he was doing the left-hand floor tom thing. I think I might have experimented with that a little bit in those days. Yeah. But, you know, honestly, I don't really think I've done the left-hand floor tom thing. I Most of my kits have, I don't know if I've ever re really owned a kit that had a second floor tom. So I'm not sure I even had the option to do that. Most of my yeah. kits have just had a single 14-inch floor tom. <laughs> sure. Um, I'd, it's probably just end up, I'd put my cell phone on it <laughs> and like a, some water well, and then Keith, not use it. Keith Moon had, you know, a floor tom that was just dedicated to sticks. And, you know, he had another yeah. one that was dedicated to drinks and towels. <laughs> Buddy, <laughs> Buddy Rich's second floor tom was just for towels. You know, he never yes. played the second floor tom, right? L Lars, I'm speaking again from just doing that, was his second floor tom was known as the coffee table. So <laughs> what's well, important to hydrate, man? You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, okay. The cool. next kit we have is 1968. And again, this is a very poorly documented kit, although there are a couple of great photos. There's really only a couple. And there's two photos from the same club that I mentioned, the Both And, which is a club in San Francisco in these days. And you see the band playing. 
and you see Tony playing this kit. And this would actually possibly be from the same run at the both and that um, that Mike Clark talked about seeing. But I don't actually see – there isn't a ride symbol on his left. Although, well, you tell me. I see some me, rivets maybe. There's in a, in rivets. A- and to me, it almost looks like a Chinese symbol because it sort of looks like it's it's got like kind of, you know, the flanged edges. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. maybe it's a normal ride symbol. Maybe it's a normal ride symbol with rivets. You know, yeah. and that would actually it could be because that would really support exactly what Mike Clark was talking about. Yes. Um, and and just as a reminder, we're going to talk about symbols yeah. more in the next part, just as a reminder yeah. that someone's commenting. Why are you not talking about symbols? That's there's that's part two. This, this <laughs> that's, that's part two or yeah. three. Uh, yeah, for, so am I seeing am I seeing two floor toms? You here sure or? are. So okay, that's the cool. interesting thing about this kit. This kit, at least this day when they took these photos, this kit had a second floor tom. It looks like a sixteen past the fourteen. And what you can see there is the very clear distinction between the small lugs on the fourteen inch floor tom and the big lugs on the sixteen inch floor tom. This is exactly what I was talking about before. And you can also see the sixteen with the big lugs has longer tension rods. And that's exactly what I was talking about with the two kits ago where he had the big lugs on the 14 inch floor tom. So yep. everything else about this kit spec'd out the same 12, 14, and 18 inch bass drum, a 4160 snare again. He's got the, the uh, muffler knobs facing front. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the only difference with this kit is the. Um, is the second floor tom uh we'll talk about this when we talk about heads but you see he started using a black front bass drum head with this kit which is pretty pretty cool now what's funny about this kit is these only photos that i have of this kit that i know are this kit are black and white so i can't tell if this is like a natural maple kit or if it was white or if it was possibly the first yellow kit that he had but one thing I do know is in 19, sorry, in 2005, there was an auction of a lot of jazz memorabilia. Um, it was a, a the Guernsey jazz auction. And there were a lot of things like one of Charlie Parker's saxophones was sold. And I think maybe like one of Dizzy Gillespie's trumpets and all these really important bits of jazz memorabilia. Sure. And if you zoom in on this photo and you look to the left, one of Tony's kits sold So he had, we're going to get to this, in 1970, he had a 12, 14, 18 yellow kit. Now, this could be that 12, 14, 18 yellow kit, because that also, he used a black front head on that. But this, in this photo, the, the, the color of it, it looks a little more like it could be a natural maple. Yeah. Yeah, does it that does. Look like and it it's, to you? It, it's almost like that that Ringo kind of like that Ludwig like thermo thermogloss or whatever kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's that style of like right natural. Now I, I have to study this a little closer, but you know the 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 um the nineteen seventy uh, yellow kit, which we'll get to in a minute, definitely had at least on the floor tom. We can see it had a uh, stop sign badge, which is you know period correct for that time, of course. Unfortunately, in the Guernsey Jazz Auction photo, we don't see any badges on this kit because the the other you know the muffler knob side is facing front. So we can't really tell. I just don't know if there's any way we can differentiate whether this is the 1968 kit or if this is the uh, the 1970 yep. kit. I'm leaning towards this being the 1968 kit and that v- thus being that the 68 kit was actually a maple finish kit. But until we see a color photo from 1968, we just won't know for sure. Maybe I have to ask Mike Clark. Maybe Mike Clark will remember what color those drums were because that's when he said he said he saw them in 68 for the first time. So maybe he remembers. And Um, it raises the question of if this went on on auction in 2005, this kit is clearly this one still exists. Someone has it in their collection, but it would be the question of backdating it to connect it to these black and white photos to tell or right. I don't know maybe there's better pictures of that person's collection who bought it I hope so yeah I, cancel it out that it's not yet yeah, the yellow if, one if the thing. person who bought that kit um is watching please get in touch with us let us know as much as you feel like you want to let us know about that kit I'd love to know what kind of badges are on the kit what the color yep. is is there an extra floor tom etc anything you want to tell us please where we we yep. want the info we don't we don't know so <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, I, I, I want to remind me to talk about the auction because this next kit, I think, possibly 
was owned by somebody else later and auctioned off. But the next kit we get to is in 1969. So in February of 69, um, Tony makes his last recordings with Miles and leaves the band and starts his own band called um, the Tony Williams Lifetime, which was an organ trio with John McLaughlin on guitar and Larry Young on organ and enormously important band um, generally like credited by most people to have sort of been the real start of fusion. Mm. Um, you know, Miles was experimenting with fusion and there were other things that were sort of, you know, it was bubbling, it was happening in these days, but this album is like, oh my God, this is fusion. This is a true fusion of jazz and rock music, jazz and rock sensibilities and really great band, really important. And for this era, for this record and the tours that they did initially, uh, Tony got a new kit, same size as 12, 14, 18. There's no second floor, Tom. He's using the 4160 snare. This kit, though, appears to be a walnut finish kit, which would have been also like the maple would have been a new finish for Gretsch. You see a really nice sort of detail of it if you zoom in on the 1969 Gretsch ad. You see the kit, you know, this is this is the kit as set up beautiful. by Tony. Yeah, it is. It is beautiful. Same size as he's got the muffler knobs facing out on the rack, Tom. Um, what difference is, I haven't seen any of the other kits so far. I have not noticed that they, none of them have had the Pratt muffler, which is the bass drum muffling system that yes. Gretsch invented, that Jimmy Pratt invented for Gretsch. But this kit does have that knob. You can actually see it in the... Um, in some of these photos, yeah, Um, which that goes back. I remember in the John Densmore gear episode that goes back to the fifties. Yes. I'm not mistaken. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was around 54 that that was sort of pioneered and it was kind of standard. I I mean, I think you could request to get a kit that didn't have it. I think it came standard on a Gretsch kit in those days. You could request it without, but also I think arbitrarily they'd sometimes just ship without them. I don't yep. know if you know whether you requested it or not. I think it was like <laughs> if they had some, they put them on it, but sometimes they yeah. ran out. Um, now there's another. There are a couple good photos from so they're they're the debut album of this band was called Emergency, and everybody should listen to this record. It's amazing. It's mind blowing. Mm-hmm. So there's a nice sort of photo of the three of them together, and then there's a second sort of a montage of photos. And in the upper left, you see a photo of Tony on his kit, and you can see it looks like he's got the black bass drum head on the kit again, which is interesting. And you don't see that in the Gretsch ad. In the Gretsch ad, um, he's got a white head on the front. Um, No logo either way, which is pretty interesting. It's Um, interesting for the Gretsch, like, ad they didn't just slap I know. the head with a logo on it. I know right well you know there are a lot of Gretsch ads actually um there's I know there's one with Max Roach and I think maybe even one of the ones with Tony where um they showed up at the photo shoot without a logo head and they actually sort of they didn't have Photoshop in the day of course but they they used you know whatever technology they had to touch up photos at the time they actually yeah. put a Gretsch logo on the front bass drum head and you can sometimes tell it's pretty is kind of haphazardly put on. You can you can kind of tell looking at some of those photos that like yeah. that's not they, really on there. They probably cut it out of paper and laid it on yes, and took exactly. a photo of that. That's uh, how yeah. they would do that in those days. Yep. Yep. Um, there's some good photos of this band playing at uh, the Monterey Jazz Festival in 1969, which is amazing to think about. Like, you know, 1963, we looked at the photos of Tony playing with Miles as a 17-year-old. And, and now here he is, you know, it's really not very long later, what, seven years later or something, six years later. Unbelievable. He's headlining no. Monterey as, as a band leader and has just come so incredibly far as a musician, as a drummer, and as an yeah. influencer. Um, yeah. We've got the badge facing out. And, on as this photo. To the, that's right. Yeah, on that's this photo right. as opposed to yeah. the muffling. So an interesting thing that popped up um, – a few years ago was that um, I remember, I think it was on drumforum.org. Somebody posted like, Oh, one of Mitch Mitchell's Gretsch kits is on, is on the auction block. Um, so I looked at the link. It's like, okay, that, well, that's pretty interesting. Mitch Mitchell. I'm, I'm not a Mitch Mitchell. I, I like Mitch Mitchell, but I've, I haven't really followed his, his kits. I know he had Ludwig and um, maybe a premiere too. And, and he had a big Gretsch kit with two bass drums, but 
so there's an auction, and if you Google Mitch Mitchell Gretsch drums, you'll you'll find this auction site. You'll find the listing. It's you know the kit sold, um, but the listing is still active, hmm. and it's one of those things where like sadly whoever auctioned this kit didn't really know that much about drums and didn't do a whole lot of research because now it was a kit that Mitch Mitchell owned, but it um I'm gonna look at the listing actually and what they say about it. Um, a Mitch Mitchell drum kit used in the studio and in rehearsals. D. Mitchell, Mitch's wife, explained that this kit was a favorite of Mitch's. It was given to him in 1968 by American drummer Tony Williams. Oh, wow. Um, okay. With this kit, Mitchell performed with Williams and Miles Davis. So I don't know about Mitch Mitchell playing with either Tony or with Miles Davis, but maybe maybe he did. Um, what's interesting about this is that the photos in the auction – of the actual kit are of a 12, 14, 18 walnut Gretsch kit. And I think it's possible this might be Tony's, you know, 1969 emergency kit. Oh, wow. That he gifted to Mitch Mitchell. Yeah. Which it looks like it was used on the Rolling Stones rock and roll well, circus. So take uh, a, if you look at the photo of Mitch Mitchell playing what they think is this kit, this is where, you know, sadly, somebody didn't really know a whole lot about drums because most people who are drum nerds will know that that's Mitch Mitchell playing Charlie Watts Gretsch oh, Black yeah, Nitron sure. kit. That's a, that's 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 a that's black. That's thirteen sixteen twenty two. You know yeah. the Rolling Stones it's, were the host of the Rock and Roll Circus and Charlie's you know, drums. It's yeah. Charlie's drums. Yeah, that's not the same kit. That's this is you know this walnut kit that we're looking at definitely was owned by Mitch Mitchell, but it's not the same kit that's in the photo with the the you know the Rock and Roll Circus photo. Yes. Um, but, you know, interesting. People make it sold these. for twenty eight thousand yeah, dollars, which is pretty wild. It and, is. And well, Mitch I got to mention the uh, the Mitch Mitchell fan club on Facebook. Kevin Simon, great guy, does an mm. awesome job of displaying Mitch Mitchell kits at drum shows and stuff. So, yeah, go there and, and people can start a conversation about this. This there. Because, so, you know, yeah. And we could, you know, I would love it if anybody wanted to comment on this kit specifically, if anybody knows more about it. I, I don't know. I, I just I see a black bass drum front head that could have have been something that was put on later we don't know um the hoops don't match but you know a lot of the time vintage kits the hoops get beat up and they get replaced the only thing that it that doesn't match with the photos of tony's kit from this era now tony's kit has a um a pratt muffler which this kit does but but this kit also has the gretch diamond plate symbol holder mounted on the bass drum which tony's kit did not have so if this was indeed tony's 69 emergency kit um somebody put the gretsch uh symbol mount on the bass drum at a later point so that's the only thing that doesn't really line up um yeah i think one tell is the fact that if you look at mitch's kit here you can see the round badge on the floor tom is a little bit high of center it's kind of like north of center, whereas in the 60s, it would be a little more centered. Um, I couldn't find any photos of Tony's kit in 69 where you see the uh, where you see the round badge on the floor, Tom. So I can't verify like, oh, it's the same height or it's centered the way it would normally be. So I don't sure. really know. That method of using, I think Brooks Tegler calls it the fingerprint method, where you you look at the photos and you judge the height and the yeah. all that stuff is, is very valid. And yeah, I don't I can't, you know. If another photo emerges that has that in it, that'd be a great tell. If anybody you know? has a photo with you could see, you know, the, the walnut kit of Tony's with the, you know, where you can see the uh, the badge, then that would be great. Send it along. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the next kit is the yellow kit. This is the first verifiably yellow kit. As I said, the 68 kit, maybe it was yellow. This kit, we know for sure. This is a this is a this is a yellow kit, man. Yeah, that's yellow. This is the kit that he got. Um, he started using it in 1970, um, around the time that um, the Tony Williams Lifetime did their second album, which is called Turn It Over. And Jack Bruce had joined the band. It, it expanded from an organ trio. And mm -hmm. this is another 12, 14, 18 kit. Now there are some photos. You can see a bunch of photos from Newport. He, he played the Newport Jazz Festival with this group. You see him with a matching wood snare, uh, five and a half uh, wood snare. Um, there are other photos from New York that I think are from a club called Count Basie's um, 
taken um, in 1970. And you can see him playing the same kit, but with a uh, 4160 chrome over brass snare. So that snare is still kind of in the mix, um, which is cool. And again, yeah. we got the uh, the black front bass drum head. That's still the look he's rocking at that point. And was he inspired by someone else that you know of to go yellow? Like, like obviously, you know, he 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 early on wanted to look like um, Max Roach, yeah. or was this just this is his? Because he he you know, I think everyone knows this. If you're this far into this, Tony Williams equals yellow drum set. That's kind of what we think. You know. I know, I know. But but as we've just noticed, you know, his whole career from, you know, he started recording in 63 um, and moved to New York, started recording, touring. From 63 to 69, he does not have yellow drums yet. No, exactly. Um, but I'm saying it, he became yeah. known for it later. But yeah. do you think he... He just they they release the color and I don't know I I mean it's not in the catalog you know this color oh, okay. this color is not in the Gretsch catalog until I mean actually it's not officially in the Gretsch catalog until the poster catalog which came out I think in eighty <laughs> three so more than ten wow. years after this you know Tony's started to use this color did it actually appear officially in the catalog now there are definitely yeah. yellow drums floating out there you know from the 70s besides ones that Tony owned so it was obviously sure. a finish you could get but it wasn't really advertised by Gretsch officially until um 83 I think is when the poster catalog came out they call it that because it's a it's a catalog but it's actually also a big poster that you unfold oh that's cool yeah it's a great it's a really cool catalog um yeah but this this is a this is a really I mean I love this kid I, I just think that that yellow is so beautiful and and yeah. I, I always wanted to own a yellow Gretsch kid I, I I mentioned in um the Neil podcast that Neil also owned a yellow Gretsch kit that he kept at yeah. home um Elvin Jones had a yellow Gretsch kit and um, uh, my fellow uh, professor of jazz drums at Juilliard, Billy Drummond, ha he plays a yellow Gretsch kit and Will Calhoun plays a yellow Gretsch kit now. It's just a cool, yeah, yeah. man. I mean, it's just cool. It's so cool. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's a, you know, like I, Tony liked cars. Um, Ferrari were famous for having a really cool yellow finish, you know, like Ferrari are most famous for red, but probably mm -hmm. their second most famous finish is, is a very similar yellow to this, this sort of like bright yellow. It's sort of bright, but mellow at the same time. I just, I just love it. It is mellow. It's exactly how I would describe it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the next kit after that, however is one that I cannot for the life of me tell if it's yellow or natural maple. And I'm pretty sure it's natural maple. And again, there are not a ton of color photos, but there's some good video of this kit. But this kit that he used from 71 to 72, and this is where we see the first change. And this is where we get kind of like, I mean, he had that second floor tom briefly in 68, right? But to mm -hmm. me, this is the first kit that starts to hint at what was to come because he's got two rack toms with this kit. And there's a great video from 72 where he's playing with Stanley Clark and Jean-Luc Ponty in France. And he does a long solo and he does a lot of the stuff that he becomes associated with in the later 70s and into the 80s and 90s where he do these long sort of beautiful rolls around like open snare and around the toms kind of going and playing these beautiful, long, sustained, almost like a like a violin, just playing a note, you know, and just sustaining like that. I mean, it was it's it, strikingly great drumming. And, you know, that's that's kind of like I think he was inspired by having even just one more tom to kind of get into this different language. And um this kit, uh again, also Gretsch. Um I should have mentioned that the um the yellow kit, the 70 kit, is the first kit that we verifiably see uh, the stop sign badge, which Gretsch mm -hmm. switched the stop sign badge around 69. And the, his 69, uh, the walnut kit, has round badges, but that uh, yellow kit's the first one with stop sign. So this is another stop sign badge kit. And this, I'm... This this is this I'm positive is a kit with two 12-inch toms. It's not a 12 and a 13 but two 12s and then a 14 inch floor tom. And this is one where I've never been able to quite be positive whether the bass drum is an 18 or a 20. I think it's an 18. 
It looks like an 18 and it definitely sounds like an 18. There are a couple photos where it looks like it could maybe be bigger, but it's yeah. probably an 18. There's there there are interviews where he talks specifically about going from an 18 to a 24. And he doesn't make mention of, you know, anything in between. So I, I think this yeah. is, you know, it looks 18 to me because yeah. the height of the toms in comparison to the, right. the length of the tom mount. Looking at your first couple photos in Berlin, wh so what's up with the finish and the like ah. the drawing all over well, the shell? The funny thing about that is, unless the dates are wrong, there are photos of him and video that are dated 1971, where you see the kit with all of this sort of like psychedelic design, like all these, like it, it, it looks like somebody painted the drums for him. Um, yeah. Or even maybe just like magic markered on them. It almost looked like a little kid drew <laughs> look, on them. It or looks something, like a kid, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the color photo from Berlin, where he's got the red shirt, is kind of where you, you really see this quite quite well and quite vividly. Yes. And and also in this photo, it looks like a natural maple kit. The finish looks like maple to me. But again, it's sometimes yeah. hard to tell with stage lighting. Um, but then there's video and photos of this exact same kit from 1972 where it looks like it's the same kit, but there's no design or anything on it. And it looks yellow. And it looks, yeah, I mean, maybe it's another More kit. More yellowy to me. Maybe it's yeah, another, yeah. You, you might be right. Maybe it's a whole nother kit. Maybe that's, that's, a, that's another kit in the exact same sizes. You yeah. know, man, you could, yeah, I think you maybe got me but on like, that. Because to I, me, there's <laughs> I hadn't really thought about the fact that that could just be a, a whole nother kit. And the same, you know, 12, 12, 14, 20, or 14, 18, sorry. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, I now I got to do some more research and see if there's anything that can give that away as being a different kit, like something different about the the badge placement or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, they would either have to like rewrap it or something, but right. then sometimes that comes up with these gear episodes where it's like was it this and then did they take it back and rewrap it? But you wonder like why would they rewrap it and not just give them a new kit because Right. I would What's easy? I know? would think they just give them a new one, but you know, it's possible he didn't like what you know he, he got sick of the psychedelic sort of finish um and and you know he just wanted it you know but they weren't doing as far as i know they weren't doing yellow wrap yet you know they started oh, okay. doing a yellow nitron which is a wrap version of the yellow but i believe through the 70s it was always a lacquer and they didn't gotcha. start doing the 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 wrap version until um the 80s um i did get verification from um the guy that sold Neil his yellow Gretsch kit told me that Neil's kit was indeed a wrap. It was yellow nitron and not yellow lacquer, which I is see. kind of fun. Um, yeah. I also got confirmation of the sizes, 8 by 12, 9 by 13, 14 by 14, 14 by 20, and a 5 by 14 wood snare in Neil's kit. Um, cool. Anyway, sorry, little little yeah, side yeah, yeah. note. No, that's cool. And, and it's pretty neat, though, to see uh, in the 72 live photo where it clearly yeah. is either – it looks like it's been it's a different kid or whatever. The five set behind him, Billy Cobham. Uh, I was going to say that looks like Billy Cobham. It's definitely drums. Billy That's, Cobham's kit. So whatever yeah. band Tony was playing with appears to be opening for Mahavishnu Orchestra. Yes, very cool. That's definitely Billy's um, clear fives kit. You can see the ride and the china on the left of the kit. You know, yeah. When I look at this color photo, that that looks much more like yellow to me than than maple. So. I think you I think you were onto something. I think you got me on this. I think that's a new kit. I think that could be a completely different kit than the one yep. with the uh, psychedelic drawings on it. Um, there, are, there are a lot of photos taken in 1971 in Copenhagen by a great photographer named Jan Persson, who actually took a lot of the great photos of Tony in 1964 in Europe. Um, as well, but these photos are, are fantastic. These these great photos from um, seventy one, um, and you can see some nice detail in the the one called Copenhagen Side One. There's some really nice detail of the uh, of the of the uh, kit. Yeah, see, look at this. That looks like natural maple that's painted on, right? That does. That's completely. not yellow. And check it out. The 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 second rack tom. The uh, badge is upside down. You notice that? Oh yeah. See the Gret it says Gretsch yep. on the bottom. And yeah, he exactly. had that turned upside down for some reason. Sometimes in those days, like guys would they would break 
a head and they just flipped the drum around because when it was on a rail mount, you could just take the drum off, flip exactly. it around, and it fit the same way on the rail. I should actually, since I mentioned that, if you look at one of the Copenhagen front photos, um, Tony was using um, the Gretsch double tom holder of the day, which I ha actually have the uh, catalog number. It's the um, 4936. That's the Gretsch catalog number of their, their original double tom mount was basically a double rail mount. You know, it's, it's sort of and like you would two. Just yeah, you'd clip it on, it on. and yep. it had sort of like adjustment where you could kind of like turn them this way, but you couldn't angle them that way or that way just yeah, like sort of yeah. front or back and that was it it was very limited um, sure but that's what he had on on that kit okay that's that's super cool then where do we go from there we're at 73 well, correct yeah basically so there's this funny period where tony there are actually a couple of periods in his career where he didn't do a lot of music and he talked about this a little bit in some interviews where he you know was kind of burnt out and um he had actually bought a house he had bought a brownstone in harlem and he actually he turned it into a rental property and was able to make enough income from this rental property that he owned that he didn't have to work he didn't have to play music if he didn't <laughs> want to and he there was some periods of time where he wasn't inspired to do anything or not consistently inspired and and there's sort of these down periods where he didn't record much or he didn't appear so this is sort of one of these periods and interestingly it's where he kind of transitions into what we know famously as the big tony kit which is the the you know two rack toms three floor toms the big 24 inch yep. bass drum the deep snare which he used consistently through the rest of his career but there's this brief transitional period and some of these things actually just kind of popped up uh, very recently, because this sort of unknown film was released, um, Tony made a trip to Africa. He went to Senegal um, to uh, basically to play drums and I think to kind of play with master drummers in Africa and to sort of absorb that music. I sadly yeah. haven't seen the film. It had a very limited screening in New York um, a year or so ago, but I was out of the country touring and I wasn't able to see it. So I still haven't seen it, but there's some interesting sort of stills and promo things. Um, yeah, it looks awesome. Yeah. So this is again, definitely a yellow kit. Now it's possible. This is the same kit that we saw in 72, but this is definitely a bigger bass drum. Now, yeah. this could be a 24, it could be a 22. I'm not really sure. There's this great picture, it's labeled 73 in Africa 2, where he's playing just a bass drum, a snare drum, and one cymbal. That looks right? cool. It's There's something very so cool, cool about that setup. Now, yeah. if we zoom in on the cymbal, I'm not sure, but that looks like it could be a Peisty 2002 logo. But very it, brilliant, very, but it doesn't very look, shiny. But it doesn't look like a Peisty. It's it's too shiny. It looks like a brilliant yeah, yeah. Zildjian. Yeah, yeah. But that logo doesn't look like a Zildjian logo. So what we have is a five and a half by fourteen snare. And what's interesting is the snare has a Camco strainer on it. Um, for whatever reason. Actually, I should have mentioned this in 1972, the video that I pointed out or that I mentioned where he's doing, does a solo with the rolls around the toms. He uh, is, is using a snare with the same snare. Maybe it's the same drum, but it, a, a Gretsch five and a half by 14 with a Camco strainer on that video hmm. too. So it's possible that's it's the same drum, but that's a bigger bass drum for sure. I mean, I, that's not a, that's definitely not an 18. It doesn't look like a 20 to me. It looks like a 22. So this bass drum, we can see in the photo number one, um, the bass drum has a Pratt muffler on it. Um, although he looks like he has some other muffling on it. There's, I see a little felt something or other sticking out of the, the side of the drum. Um, it also looks like two 12s and a 14. So that's why I think it could be the, possibly the same toms from the previous kit, but with a bigger bass drum. Um, and then there's this one final photo of him playing outdoors, playing the same setup. Um, which is super cool. Um, but this is sort of the transitional kid. And I, I think I'll kind of stop here because the next time we see him, so Tony Williams in Africa was filmed in 1973. And then we don't really see him again until 1975 when he starts an all new band and starts using the famous big kit. And um, we'll pick that up uh, in the next episode, I think. 
Yeah. What we'll do is we'll do part two. We'll likely talk about uh, Tony's drums, including, you know, his famous yellow monster drum set here up through basically when Garrison will take over into the 90s uh, with the DW stuff. But I think the order will go part one, what we just did, part two up through 90s, I guess. Yeah. Part three will cover the symbols with Paul, but part two we'll talk about uh, through the 90s, probably his backline kits, maybe some hardware if we have time, but yeah. you and I know that we run out of time pretty quickly. But um, And then part three will be the symbols and uh, whatever else we want to cover. Then maybe part four we'll have Garrison on to cover that part of Tony's life. And uh, I think it's awesome. I mean, I think it it, it, it if, to have the like definitive, you know, um, uh, kind of, I don't know, examples. And, and here is what the gear is, is, is a really cool thing. Yeah. So uh, well, I think I, it makes sense. I'm trying to be, I mean, I hope I can be some, something approaching definitive. I, I, I mean, there's no, there's really no way of being definitive because there's just, there's, there's so much that unfortunately has been lost to time. We don't know where most of these kits are anymore. Yeah. And, you know, there's only so much you can, I try to do my best picking up information from photos, but there's still things that, you can miss. And I, I do, you know, encourage anybody to, to please um, contact us, uh, leave messages, send, send us, you know, social media messages if you want, you know, just, you know, if you have information on this stuff, if you know, if you have some of these drums or, you know, somebody who does, or, or you saw him, you know, on a gig in 1965 and you can tell me about the big lugs on the floor toms or something like yeah. that, please feel free. I, I'm so into getting this information and I, I don't claim to know all of this stuff definitively. I, I'm trying my best, but um, I want yep. more info, so so bring it on. Um, before I, I I wrap up, though, I do want to thank a couple of people. Even though yes. we didn't, there, there's there's some of the stuff we didn't even really get to. But you know, I, I mentioned Michael Cascuna, who gave us permission to use the Francis Wolf photos. Um, I want to thank Bill Maley, uh, who gave me a lot of information on um, vintage drums in general. Uh, Jess Birch at Good Hands Drum Shop and Steve Maxwell, of course, of Steve Maxwell's Drum Shop, um, helped me track down some great information on Tony Symbols, which we'll get to later, and some other drums that he owned. Um, a gentleman named Peter Lawson, who runs a website, um, a Miles Davis website that has incredible chronology of basically every known gig that the the 60s band with Tony did you know for example like I was able to piece together you know the dates of when he did certain gigs that I found photographs of so I could tell you oh this kit was 63 to 64 or this kit was 68 or whatever that that a lot of yeah. that inform information comes from Peter Lawson's website um I want to thank John to Christopher too, who gave me some great information on Tony sticks, which we'll get to probably, you know, in part 12 of the episode. <laughs> um, but, but John was incredibly gracious with information and really helpful. So um, thanks to all of those uh, wonderful yeah. people. Absolutely. Uh, and then Dave Goodman for, yes. he did the previous one on, and, and Rob Hart for doing the other stuff. And it's just, yeah. Any, it's, anybody it's interested effort. in this stuff should really listen to those two episodes as well. Cause they're, they're really amazing, uh, valuable sources of info. And, D and Dave's rundown of Tony's life is, is, I mean, you know, the, the drums are one thing. I mean, the, the life that this guy lived was just ex absolutely extraordinary. And yeah, he was a remarkable and too short. person, Very, way, way too, too short. short. It's just so tragically short. And, and, um, yeah, Dave's info is wonderful. So, um, please listen yeah. to those episodes too. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I just want to say, Paul, thank you for doing, I mean, this is not our first rodeo here. This is, <laughs> this is our, you know, we've done this before, but yeah. we, you, you were doing this kind of out of the love of Tony and, and, uh, Absolutely. and, and, and just the quest for knowledge. And, uh, I think everyone appreciates you doing this to, to learn this info. And, um, it's just incredible that you've compiled all these photos and everything and giving me and, and our listeners so much time. So oh, you're welcome. Uh, appreciate it. Do you want to plug anything as we end here? Like oh. albums, your YouTube channel, anything kind of, I, I mean, if you're interested in what I do, I mean, I have a website, paulwellsdrums.com. 
Um, I'm Paul Wells Drums on Instagram. Um, God, I don't post that much, but I do try to keep my website up to date with gigs. If anybody's in the New York area wants to see me play, I usually have uh, everything's up to date. So if you look at my schedule on my website, you can see when those gigs are. One of them is actually tomorrow night. Uh, Wednesday, uh, September 6th, although this will air well this after This will be that. up yeah. in like January or something. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, at all. right. Well, but, anyway. But check, yeah. check Paul's website, you know. yeah. But that's yeah. it. I'm not a big plugger, unfortunately, which is, you know, I should be better yeah. at that, but. No, that's all right. Yeah. I think I think the knowledge and everything you're dropping here, people can. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. You're a phenomenal drummer and everything, so people can check your website out. But uh, all right, Paul, well, then we will figure out how to, how to tackle the rest of this <laughs> and we can uh, people can look forward to watching part two. Yes. Maybe someone will be lucky enough to find this like two years down the road and can watch all four parts. In one <laughs> <sitting>. <laughs> but that uh, that's the dream. That's the dream. So, okay, <laughs> Paul, well, thank you for being here, my friend, and I will see you in part two. Thank you, Bart. Looking forward to it.